that. So I'm going to talk about this uh, project with Zach Hamaker and Anna Weigant. And Anna's here, so if there's questions, uh, maybe she will like resolve them in the chat or uh, tell me when they go wrong. And if you don't like listening to the talk, there's also uh, this paper online, so you can just read the paper and ignore me if you prefer that. Okay. Okay, um, some technical difficulties. So I'm gonna talk about the uh, flag variety. So we're gonna talk about some sort of interesting questions coming from linear algebra that you can think about combinatorially and you can think about geometrically. And so I'm gonna think about in a vector space in CN, I can take uh, you know, a flag of nested subspaces. Right? So one way I can get a flag of nested subspaces if I have an ordered basis of my space, like maybe the standard basis, well, I can start by taking just the origin. And then I can say, well, what's my favorite line through the origin? Why don't I just take the span of the first coordinate vector? So that's things that look like this. And then if I want some kind of plane containing that line, I could just well take the span of the first two of my basis elements. And I can get a three plane by just taking the span of the first three things. And if I take the span of everything, of course, that's the whole space. So every ordered basis gives me such a flag. So I can think of this as sort of like the space of ordered bases, but it's weaker than that because not uh, the same flag will correspond to different choices of ordered basis in some way. Okay, but it's a related sort of object. Okay, so this is just a set, and so the set of nested subspaces like this, but we can actually think of it geometrically because if I think of the normal action of the general linear group on my vector space, it doesn't just move the points of the vector space around, it actually moves the flags around. It has an action on flags. And so by the orbit stabilizer theorem, basically, I can identify this space as uh, the group that's acting, the general linear group quotiented by the stabilizer of my favorite flag. And this said might as well be my favorite flag. Okay, so stabilizer of this flag is just upper triangular matrices. So I'm looking at the quotient of the full general linear group by the upper triangular matrices. And this has geometry because uh, a matrix is just specifying n squared numbers. Okay, so you can talk about two matrices being close to each other. You have geometry topology going on here. So I wanna understand what does this space look like? It tells me what flags are going on? Well, there's some nice structure in the general linear group that you see when you're first learning linear algebra. Uh, one thing you like to do is you take your matrix and you're like, gosh, I wish my matrix was upper triangular. And so you like try to put it in an upper triangular form by doing row operations. And the row operations you do are, you know, multiplying by some lower triangular matrices to do those row operations. And like most of the time this works, but sometimes you can't just do that. Sometimes you have to actually permute some rows in your matrix. So there's some, some permutation matrix that gets stuck inside here. Right? Sort of generically, uh, you know, you don't have to do any permutations. And so you're gonna get one piece of the general linear group where you have the identity permutation here. And so you get some sort of big blob for that piece. And then you're gonna get for various uh, amounts of row swaps you have to do, you're gonna get these other pieces of the general linear group. And so here's my picture of the general linear group. It's sort of these blobs of smaller sizes. Okay, so we have this decomposition of the general linear group. And we said the flag variety was just a quotient of the general linear group. So we can map down this kind of blob structure onto the flag variety also. We just take these cells and take their quotients by upper triangular matrices. Okay, and so these are the Schubert cells. And they're very nice. They really are just cells. They're just affine space. They just look vector spaces but they're glued together in some sort of interesting, complicated way. And like in geometry, you like to work with things that are closed. So let's take closures of these cells. These are the Schubert varieties. Okay. So these are very nice. So we wanna understand like, what does this picture look like? It doesn't look like this. This is uh, me you know, doing a very bad schematic. It's hard to understand these like high dimensional spaces. And so we have these algebraic tools like cohomology. So cohomology is a way you know, it eats a space 
cohomology eats the space and it gives you back uh, a ring. And the hope is that rings are easier to understand. So in this case, if I take the flag variety and I feed it into cohomology, the ring that I get is a very nice concrete ring. It's just a quotient of a polynomial ring. I take this polynomial ring in n variables and I'm going to quotient by uh, polynomials that are symmetric in permuting the variables. So I look at uh, a polynomial, I can act by a permutation permuting all the subscripts of the variables and maybe I get a different one, maybe I don't. So it's symmetric if I get the same permutation back and I'm going to kill off all the symmetric permutation symmetric polynomials that have uh, no constant term. I better not kill off the constant polynomials. Okay, so here's some very concrete ring. And it turns out that every one of my Schubert varieties has a class in this ring. So there's some coset in this ring that corresponds to every Schubert variety. And they're actually a basis. So if you want to understand the ring structure here, you want to understand how things multiply, it's enough to understand how the Schubert classes multiply. So really, we'd be very happy if we just sort of knew like which cosets here correspond to which Schubert varieties. Okay, but working with cosets is always a pain, right? The problem with quotient objects is that cosets don't have nice names, right? You can name an element of, you can name the coset by any element inside it. There's no sort of canonical choice. And so you always have to uh, worry about that, except Lescoux and Schutzenberger said that in fact, there is a nice way to make choices of coset representatives here. And they said like, uh, you should do it our way. Our way, uh, we call them Schubert polynomials. So they told us some way to pick an element of each coset here uh, that they say is better than all the others. And this is, this is weird, you can't usually do such a thing. But here's the ways in which they're right about these being really nice. So if I multiply two of these classes together, I said I had a basis. So I'm going to get some linear combination of basis elements. If I work with cosets and I take two coset representatives and I multiply them together, I'm going to get something that's equivalent to some linear combination of coset representatives. But usually it's going to be modulo, uh, modulo the ideal. I'm going to have to like remove all these things that uh, count as zero. And that doesn't happen with Schubert polynomials. When you have some product here in the cohomology ring, it corresponds to uh, an exact equality of polynomials. I multiply two polynomials and I can actually expand it in Schubert polynomials. I don't have to do any reductions. And that's amazing. You can't, you can't just sort of come up with things like that. And there's another thing that's nice is if I think about uh, the permutation groups, they're sort of not just one permutation group, but they make you know, a nice tower of permutation groups. I want to think of the permutation 2, 1, 4, 3 and S4. Uh, it's, it's basically the same thing as 2, 1, 4, 3, 5 and S5. Right? It permutes things the same way. It just doesn't touch the fifth element. And if I want to think of these as being sort of morally the same permutation, well, it's nice that they turn out to have the same Schubert polynomial. That's a nice feature also. And then finally, these are just polynomials. Like I should write them down and some kind of, you know, write down the multinomial, multivariable polynomial. And when I do that, we notice that all of the signs here are positive. Okay, there could be some coefficients in this polynomial, but all the coefficients are non-negative integers. Okay, so it's really remarkable that you have choices of coset representatives that have all these nice features. Like, what did we do to deserve something so great? In fact, all right, so let me tell you uh, briefly like how Lescoux and Schutzenberger defined these. So the definition is going to be recursive. So I'm going to look here at my symmetric group. So at the top of my symmetric group, I've got uh, W0, this reverse permutation. At the bottom, I have the identity. And so they're going to tell you what to put at the top. The permutation at the top is going to correspond to the Schubert polynomial that's just the single monomial. And then we'll define everything else by recursing down. So the rule is when I see two elements of my permutation that are out of order and I flip them to be back in order, there's some relation between the corresponding Schubert polynomials. And it's just what I get by acting by this linear operator. 
goes to some linear operator and it lowers up the degree of my uh, polynomial. Okay, so this uh, is not super explicit. Uh, it's also not obviously well-defined even. There's a lot of mysterious things going on. It's not clear that polynomials defined like this satisfy any of the properties from the previous slide. Okay. So before I tell you about uh, how, how these are actually natural, uh, let me tell you about something even, even stranger. So if I look at this, this is my flag variety again, it has an action of diagonal matrices, right? Just diagonal matrices multiplying by these matrices here. And so I might want to keep track of this group action and this action of this diagonal matrix group. And so there's an algebraic gadget for doing that. We have something called equivariant cohomology that lets you keep track of an extra group action. Okay, so I have the equivariant cohomology of the flag variety and have these equivariant classes of Schubert varieties. And these also have polynomial representatives. These are called double Schubert polynomials and they're defined exactly the same way, same recursion down the thing. But at the very top, I'm gonna to put uh, this other polynomial. And it's the same thing as we had before, except with all these Y variables stuck inside it. And it'll recurse down exactly the same way. And these represent equivariant classes of Schubert varieties. Okay, well, something even more amazing happens here. Uh, we said that these polynomials had positive coefficients, so you might hope for some kind of combinatorics. And in fact, the combinatorics you get is really beautiful. So I'm gonna talk about certain tilings. So I'm gonna take an n by n grid, and I'm gonna tile my grid with these four little tiles. Okay, and they have to satisfy some conditions that are a little technical. So let me just show you a picture of what sort of tilings we have. I want a tiling like this. So sort of all the interesting stuff is happening in this upper left corner, okay? And when I have such a tiling, I can read off a permutation. If I just look at the numbers one through four down the left column, I can just look at those four little blue squiggles and see where they come out on the top of my picture. So first I see number two, and then I see one, and then I see four, and then I see three. So this is, the uh, permutation 2143 associated to this picture. Okay, so I, I can look at then all the, all these pipe dreams for a certain permutation and look at a generating series for them. I should figure out how to count them with what kind of weights to count them. And the weights are gonna come from looking at the crossing tiles. So the tiles like this one and this one. And I'm gonna take a cross in position ij and it's gonna get the weight xi minus yj, okay? So uh, now we get the like active learning part of this talk. Uh, who wants to tell me what the weight I should put down for this pipe dream is? Or if you don't know, ask me, ask me what I would, said that was confusing. So I've got two crossing tiles so each of them should contribute a weight. So my guess is x1 minus y2 times x2 minus y1? Uh, almost. So uh, I'm going to number the rows and columns uh, in the naive way, not, not the ones I wrote here. Hmm. So I'm going to number the uh, columns just one, two, three, four, like this also. I see. OK, so, so then X1 if I tell you that, one. yep, go ahead x1 minus y1 times x2 minus y2. Beautiful, thank you. So I'm really just sort of very naively looking at where are the positions of the plus tiles in this grid. Uh, this one's in position one, one, this one's in position two, two, and I'll just keep track of that. Cool. Okay, so that's like uh, a very nice formula for these things. It turns out if you take the permutation W, you look at all the pipe dreams that trace out the permutation W and you add up their weights, just like we had on the previous slide, that just is the double Schubert polynomial. Okay, so if I want the whole Schubert polynomial for two, one, four, three, you just look at all the possible tilings. There's only three of them and you write down the weights. So this is the one we did before. 
And you can check the other ones by giving you the other pieces of this double Schubert polynomial. So this is amazing. I, I can maybe like uh, put some more names here. The history of this theorem is a little complicated. Okay, so I want to explain to you, uh, like, it seemed like we had this choice. We had these cosets and we made this choice of coset representatives and somehow Lescu and Schutz and Berger told us are really nice choices, but it's not clear like how, how they could have done that, how there could be such a really nice choice. So I'm gonna explain like how there is such a choice that, that gives you such nice things or how it isn't a choice, how these are actually canonical. Okay, so the trick here is to not look at the general linear group, but instead to look at the space of all matrices, invertible or not. Okay, so this has an action by diagonal matrices also, it really has two actions by diagonal matrices. I can take D uh, acting on one side, scaling the rows, or I can act on the other side, scaling the columns. Okay, so I have two different actions here. Okay, so I can look at the D cross D equivariant cohomology of the space of all matrices. And the thing about the space of all matrices is it just looks like an n squared dimensional vector space. So it contracts to a point. And like a fundamental feature of cohomology theories is they can't tell contractible spaces apart from points. So this is just gonna be the same thing as equivariant cohomology of a point. And like by definition, that's just like functions uh, you know, on, on the space. And so this is really just a polynomial ring. Okay not some kind of quotient by a polynomial, but just like on the nose, it's just a polynomial ring and two n variables. n variables coming from the first copy of D and then n other variables coming from the second copy of D. So the, the upshot here, like this is all very formal, but the upshot is that if you have any set of matrices and your set of matrices is stabilized by scaling rows and columns, if it's fixed by scaling rows and columns, then it has a class in this ring and the class is just a polynomial. Okay, there's no choice to make, but you hand me this set of matrices, there just is some like associated polynomial that you have no choice in. So we'd like to sort of see if we can get our Schubert polynomials in this way, and we can. So what we were gonna do is uh, I had this thing, LWU sitting inside the general linear group, right? I, I took, the general linear group, and I looked at how to factor things, this LU decomposition. Well, the general linear group sits inside the space of all matrices. So let me take this piece of the general linear group and close it inside the set of all matrices. Okay, now in the boundary, it probably has some non-invertible stuff, but that's okay. It's just some, some set of matrices and it, it's related to the Schubert variety. So we'll call it the matrix Schubert variety And it's, it's very explicit. So you can define it just by saying that certain, uh, certain sub-matrices have certain ranks, okay? But that's all it is. Can, the point is it's a set of matrices. It's stabilized by scaling rows and columns. And that means there's some associated polynomial. Okay, so this beautiful theorem of Knudsen and Miller is that when I take uh, this particular set of matrices and I look at the polynomial you get, it's the polynomial that you were looking for all along. It is this double Schubert polynomial. So even though it looked like we were making a choice of coset representative, uh, in fact, here's a way of getting out your double Schubert polynomials without making any choices. They just appear canonically from this uh, construction in full matrix space. Okay, so this explains like why Schubert polynomials are nice, why they're a nice choice, because they're not in fact actually a choice. But it doesn't explain like, why do we have this really nice pipe dream formula? Like, why do we deserve this combinatorics? And so um, to explain where that comes in. Yeah, so go ahead. Is there a version of this for usual Schubert polynomials just inside some other, instead of side variety, take some other thing? Like, what do you mean? Single Schubert polynomials? Yeah, yeah, like without the Ys, is there yeah, a Yeah, so if, where... I, if I want to make the Ys go away, I can just kill one of these uh, D actions. And take the same matrices. Killing all the y variables. And then my single Schubert polynomials will fall out. I see. Thanks. Yeah. But so in that case, it looks kind of like you're making a choice whether you should act on the left or the right. And the symmetric version, like you really get the whole thing all at once. There's no choice. 
Okay. So we want to see where these pipe dreams actually come from. And so I'll tell you like uh, just a few basic facts about cohomology, equivariant cohomology that are enough to do everything. So I'll tell you three things. So the first thing is I'm looking in my space of matrices and I'm looking at some stable set of matrices. Maybe it's just a coordinate subspace, just a span of some coordinate vectors. In that case, I'll tell you exactly what polynomial to write down. Uh, you just write down this product, uh, keeping track of which coordinates you used to construct this coordinate subspace. Okay, the, the details don't matter, but it's just something explicit if you have a coordinate subspace. And the second thing is that if my, uh, if the thing I'm trying to compute the polynomial for, you know, has some pieces like this, what I do is I compute the polynomial for each piece separately and I add them all up. Okay, and the third thing is that if I have some kind of complicated object and I'm not really sure what's going on, I'm allowed to do something called Grosvenor degeneration of the object to something simpler. And when I do that, it doesn't change the polynomial. Okay, so this is a sort of three-step recipe for computing all sorts of uh, equivariant classes. So I need to tell you a little bit more about Grosvenor degeneration so that we can actually use this piece. Okay, so if I have a polynomial in one variable, it's very easy to say what the leading term of this polynomial is, it's the term that has the highest degree. If I have a multivariate polynomial, you have to be more careful about what you mean by the leading term. But let's just pick, pick some way of knowing what leading terms of polynomials are. And so if I do that, now if I have a bunch of polynomials, I can look at all their lead terms and I can take the ideal that they generate, the lead terms. So I get some ideal generated by monomials. It's a very nice kind of ideal, a monomial ideal. Okay, so if in particular I take my object x, like the sort of weird thing, I didn't know what it was, and I look at all the functions, all the polynomials that vanish on my weird shape, and I take all their lead terms, and I look at where all their lead terms vanish, this is some other shape. And this is the Grosvenor degeneration. So it's some sort of way of uh, making this weird wiggly thing into something less complicated. Uh, so, excuse me, sorry yeah. to interrupt, but I missed a little bit on the definition of the partial order. Do you mind defining it again? Well, so we have a lot of choice here. Um, so so what's, I'll, the, I'll, what's the property that this partial order need to satisfy? Um, very little, but I want things like, uh, you know, if I have uh, two monomials that are, if I have like uh, x to the alpha and I decided that's less than x to the beta and I want to multiply them both by like x3 then like I should have the same inequality and like maybe I want to assume that the, polyn the monomial one is smaller than everybody or something like that sort of the obvious things but it's not too important and in the end I'll make some like particular choices here okay so uh, when I do this degeneration I get this uh, ideal generated by monomials. That means that if I look at where these monomials all vanish, I'm just getting some coordinate subspaces. I'm getting a union of coordinate subspaces. So this tells me how to compute everything, right? I took my thing I didn't understand and I turned it into uh, a union of coordinate subspaces. And it has the same polynomial attached and I know how to compute the polynomial for a union of coordinate subspaces. I just add up the polynomial for each subspace separately. So if only we knew like which coordinate subspaces we got out. Okay, so somehow like this was not very explicit and we need to understand how this is going on. Okay, well, it would be nice uh, if I started with like the set of all polynomials vanishing on my weird wiggly shape. It'd be nice if I had a nice generating set for it that I could work with. But it's not true that just taking the initial terms of my generators will generate the same thing as taking the initial terms of everybody. In general, like that's gonna be smaller. I have this inclusion, but I wish I had an equality. Okay, and so what we do in math, like when we want something to be true is we just decide it's true and give it a name. So like, uh, we'll call this a Grosvenor basis if we have equality here. Okay, so a Grosvenor basis is a set of generators whose initial terms actually generate uh, the same thing as all the initial terms of everybody in the set. 
Okay, so I'm going to also now make a choice of a term order. And my choice is just going to be uh, not entirely determined, but I'm going to make the sort of choice where if I take a matrix and I want to know uh, what this minor is, the leading term is going to be the product of the things sitting along this anti-diagonal. There's various uh, ways you could do that, uh, just like weighting things in a particular way. Okay, so here's an example. So here's uh, 2, 1, 4, 3 again. I'm taking this Schubert, this matrix Schubert variety. If I look at all the functions that vanish on it, it turns out these are generated by only two things. There's this single variable and this is three by three minor. And if I think about some kind of anti-diagonal term order, it turns out these are already a Grobner basis. So I can write down the initial ideal very easily. It's just going to be the lead terms of these two things. So the lead term of Z11 is just Z11. And the lead term of this uh, is by definition the product of the things on the anti-diagonal. So Z13, Z22, Z31. Okay, and we can rewrite this as an intersection of three very simple things. Each of these corresponds to a coordinate subspace. Here's where Z11 and Z33 both vanish. Here's the subspace where Z11 and Z22 both vanish. I get three coordinate subspaces. And here are the three pipe dreams that we had earlier uh, for the permutation 2143. And if I tell you that the correspondence is like this, uh, can anyone see how these pipe dreams correspond to these ideals? I see nodding, right? So what's going on uh, here? We're supposed to care about where the plus tiles were. And uh, they just match up with the subscripts here. So this is really beautiful. So here's the, the beautiful theorems of Knudsen and Miller. So they say any time, you can take any anti-diagonal term order, right? That wasn't, you had some choice, but it doesn't matter which one. Take any anti-diagonal term order and you write down these obvious equations for, for this ideal, they're always a Grobner basis. And so since they're always a Grobner basis, you always know what the initial ideal looks like. You just take the lead terms of these obvious generators and even better than that, after you've done the degeneration, you look at which coordinate subspaces did you get, you get exactly the ones labeled by the pipe dreams. So your double Schubert polynomial is going to be the polynomial associated to uh, this union of coordinate subspaces, which is just add up the polynomials for each subspace separately. And if you just compare the formulas, let's just literally add up uh, the weights as we wrote down before for every pipe dream that we have. So this is telling us that this Grobner geometry uh, doesn't just tell us the naturality of Schubert polynomials, but it actually tells us sort of naturally where does this pipe dream formula come from? It sort of comes straight out of the geometry in this way. Well, the weird thing is there's another formula for Schubert polynomials. Okay, so we, we just concluded that this pipe dream formula is like natural canonical formula. Uh, how can there be another one? Like it must be sort of secretly the same formula. And this is some formula of Lascou. Uh, it's in terms of the square ice model from statistical mechanics. So I'm looking at some kind of picture like this and I'm going to orient all the internal edges so that at every internal vertex, I have two things coming in and two things coming out. So sort of locally, I have one of these six pictures everywhere. So this is also the six vertex model. Okay, so we're gonna look at sort of pictures like this and then somehow we're gonna get Schubert polynomials out of them. Okay, so why is this square ice? Uh, like if you imagine the water molecules uh, had right angles in them and like 180 degree angles in them, then it would look kind of like ice, but it doesn't, so like it's not ice. Okay, so, so Lescu has this formula and Lescu's formula looks like this. Uh, so I'm not actually gonna tell you Lescu's formula because as you can see, uh, it's terrifying, although it loves you. Um, so I'm gonna tell you something that's equivalent to Lescu's formula, but somehow uh, much easier to understand. 
So what we're going to do is every time we saw one of these six vertex configurations, let's forget all the arrows that go to the right and all the arrows that go up. So I'm going to forget the black parts here and just remember the red parts. That's essentially turning these little uh, vertices into these six tiles. And so if I take my full orientation of this grid here, it just turns into this kind of picture. And this picture looks sort of like a pipe dream. This is a much sort of happier thing to work with. Okay, so we'll work with this. It's called a bumpless pipe dream. It's like a pipe dream, but like the pipes go the wrong way. Right? They sort of go from the bottom out the right side. And also uh, notice that we're they're bumpless because we're uh, we're we're missing this tile, sort of the bumping tile, the thing where they bounce off each other. It doesn't show up anywhere here. This is sort of like the main tile we had before, but now it's gone. Okay, so bumpless pipe dreams seems so to be some way of tiling the grid with these tiles, uh, you know, satisfying some natural conditions on what should be a valid tiling. Okay, so I'm getting some picture like this. Okay, and just like before, there's a permutation associated. Uh, if I number the pipes along the bottom, I can just see where they pop out on the right side. So this is pipe number one. This is pipe number four, uh, three, two, five. So my permutation is one, four, three, two, five. Okay, so I can look at all the bumpless pipe dreams for a particular permutation. And I can try to put some weights on them again, just like we did before. And the obvious thing to do, of course, is to look at these crossing tiles again. But that turns out to be not what I want to do. Uh, I'm going to instead look at the blank tiles. And otherwise, it's going to be the same formula we had before. So someone else want to tell me uh, what kind of weight I should put down on this bumpless pipe dream? So I'm going to look at the blank tiles, and it's going to be the same thing as before. I'm going to record their rows and columns. Yeah. So I think it'd be uh, the empty thing is uh, y2 minus x3. Oh, sorry, the top one. Uh, and x1 minus y1. OK, so this is x1 minus y1. x1 minus y2. Yep. And x3 minus y2. x3 minus y2, exactly. Oh, what have I done? OK, so it's kind of weird. These look like sort of the least important squares in the diagram, but they're actually the ones we're going to count. And otherwise, we're just keeping track of where they are exactly the same way as before. OK, so here's this uh, amazing formula. Theorem of Lamley and Shimazono says, if you take bumpless pipe dreams that give you the permutation w, and you put down these weights corresponding to the blank tiles, you also get the double Schubert polynomial. But secretly, uh, they're just rediscovering this formula of Lascaux in a much nicer, cleaner form. And so the details are uh, spelled out in this paper of why get, how you, how you get from one to the other. Also, Lascaux's proof has like giant holes in it and things that are wrong. And so like she fixes all that. Also shows the K theory. Okay, there's more stuff in there. But sort of, uh, you know, they came to this in a completely separate way, independently. You get this different nice formula. Well, now we have a canonical formula for Schubert polynomials, and we have this other formula that's also for Schubert polynomials. They've got to be the same thing somehow. But if you look at this example, just two, one, four, three, I've got three bumpless pipe dreams. I've got three pipe dreams. You'd hope for some kind of weight-preserving bijection. Like, in fact, the Schubert polynomials have to be equal. But you'll see they're only equal after you like multiply everything out and reorganize the terms and re refactor them. There's no way to preserve the x and y weights and match these things up. It is actually a genuinely different formula for Schubert polynomials. Okay, so that's weird, right? You have a canonical formula and you have a completely different formula. And so that's uh, what I want to explain in the time I have left. So the, the thing that's going on here is that the pipe dream formula was only canonical once we decided we liked anti-diagonal orders. And anti-diagonal orders are like a nice sort of choice, but they're not maybe even the most natural. You could just as well, just as well take diagonal orders where the lead term was along the main diagonal. That makes as much sense. And 
that's going to correspond, we'll see, to the bumpless pipe dream story. So if I take 2143, uh, again, I have these generators. But if I take a diagonal term order, I might think it would be generated by Z11 and this main diagonal. But Z11 shows up in the main diagonal. So that doesn't end up actually being the, the uh, only thing there. Uh, it turns out my initial ideal is generated by these two different things. Not what we might have expected. It breaks up like this. So I get these three coordinate subspaces, not the ones I had before. And here's my three bumpless pipe dreams. And if I tell you they uh, connect like this, do we see uh, how, how, these, how these monomial ideals correspond to these bumpless pipe dreams? OK, it, it's not quite obvious if we hadn't done the other stuff, but they're just telling you where these blank tiles are. So as soon as you see the, look at the blank tiles, it's the right thing. OK, that's magic. OK, so here's uh, sort of the weak version of our conjecture. So the weak version of our conjecture is that if you take your matrix Schubert variety and then take a diagonal order and take this different degeneration, then instead of getting components labeled by normal old school pipe dreams, we're going to get components labeled by bumpless pipe dreams in this other way. Okay, so there's one sort of complication here, uh, which is that now I'm assuming something is reduced. I didn't need to do this in the anti-diagonal case. In the anti-diagonal case, the initial, the Grobner degeneration was always reduced. It didn't have any scheme structure. But when I take the diagonal thing, I can actually get scheme structure on my degeneration. So we're going to have to say something about that later. But for now, let's just ignore it. So like in the case that I don't get some kind of weird scheme thing going on, uh, the conjecture is that we just literally get the coordinate subspaces labeled by the bumpless pipe dreams. Okay, so here's some evidence for this. So the first thing uh, is about these Vexoi permutations, some kind, of, some kind of condition on permutations. So Knudsen, Miller, and Young tried to study this problem a while ago. The problem they ran into is if you took these obvious equations for your matrix ideal, matrix Schubert ideal, anti-diagonally, they were always a Grobner basis. So you always knew what your initial ideal looked like. But diagonally, they're not usually a Grobner basis. They're a Grobner basis, as they show, exactly in the case that your permutation has this vexillary property. Okay? And very few permutations are vexillary. So in that case, they could do stuff. So in that case, uh, they were able to extract the combinatorial formula uh, from these diagonal Grobner degenerations. Okay? And so it's basically these bumpless pipe dreams, like here, although actually, they're not doing that. They're doing these a uh, flagged tableau. This was a formula earlier of Michel Wax, which they explained geometrically. Okay, so they get these kind of pictures. And so uh, Anna and her paper explains also this bijection between these things. But hopefully you can see it if they're just matched up like this. And hopefully you can sort of see how uh, to get from the tableau to the bumpless pipe dreams. They're again just sort of keeping track of where the blank tiles are. Okay, so we know the theorem, the conjecture is true in this vexillary case. And so I'll tell you uh, another case where we can do this now. So the problem is that the obvious equations aren't a Grobner basis. The problem with that is you just have the wrong equations. You wrote down the wrong equations to begin with. And so I'm going to tell you a better set of generators. So when you wrote down the obvious equations, some of them were just single variables. And I claim that you should take those single variables and in the big generators that you got, the ones that are actually polynomials, throw away all the terms that contain the variables you've already have. And so this is some sort of reduction of the generators you wrote down before. And we call these CDG generators because they're sort of uh, inspired by something kind of morally similar in this work of Concord and Negri and Gorla. Okay. So these aren't always a Grobner basis, but they're a Grobner basis more often. And so there's at least some class of permutations where we can show that when you take this diagonal initial ideal, you always get something reduced. And I can tell you what the Grobner basis is. It's, it's these things here. Take the obvious ones and do these reductions to them. And in this case, we can actually track through the bumpless pipe dreams and show that the uh, coordinate subspaces that come out in the degeneration 
exactly match up with the bumpless pipe dreams in the bumpless pipe dream format. So here's an example of one of these, uh, you know, one of these other permutations and the bumpless pipe dreams that go with it. And, and theorem, the theorem we prove is actually a little more general than this, but uh, it gets kind of technical to say which permutations we can do. So I'm just telling you this piece of it. Okay, so let me tell you sort of where things go from here. Well, we also conjectured uh, a characterization of all the permutations for which these sort of better generators are a Grobner basis uh, in terms of pattern avoidance. So vexillary permutations are defined by pattern avoidance and these are defined by some more complicated list of patterns. And this conjecture was just recently proved by Patricia Klein. So now we know in fact sort of larger class of permutations uh, where we actually have a Grobner basis for these things. And uh, let me skip this corollary. It doesn't really go anywhere. Um, okay, so let me end by telling you about the non-reduced case. Right, so this is a weird thing that happens when we do diagonal stuff. Uh, we can degenerate to something that's actually a fuzzy sort of scheme. So we have this notion of multiplicity of a scheme along a component. So let me, let me actually start with this example. So if I look at the vanishing of x squared y, x squared y vanishes along the x and y axes. But it also, uh, sorry, it vanishes of x is 0, it vanishes of y is 0, but it also sort of vanishes on some infinitesimal fuzz if the x coordinate is so tiny that it squares to 0. So it's also sort of vanishing along this a little bit. You could say this polynomial vanishes to order 2 along the y-axis, vanishes to order one along the x-axis. Okay, so there's some sort of extra data that's going on here. Because so I get these multiplicities and it turns out equivariant cohomology, if you have some sort of object like this where some things are fuzzy, the polynomial you associate to the whole object is just the sum of the polynomials for each component, but then weighted by the multiplicities. So here I'm going to get twice the polynomial for this and once the polynomial for that. So this is how you deal with this thing. Okay, so this didn't happen before when we were doing anti-diagonal things. I didn't have to have coefficients out here. How can this possibly come into our pipe dreams? Well, there's something with pipe dreams that didn't happen that happens with bumpless pipe dreams. I never had two pipe dreams with the same crossing tiles. But I can, in fact, have two bumpless pipe dreams with the same blank tiles. So here's two bumpless pipe dreams. They're for the same permutation. This is 3, 2, 1, 6, 5, 4. And this is also 3, 2, 1, 6, 5, 4. And they have the same blank tile positions. But they are not the same bumpless pipe dream. Okay, so these show up, and we don't entirely understand exactly where this is happening. It seems to be also governed by pattern avoidance, but we don't know all the patterns that come into play here. There is some, you get new ones in S10, and then the computer uh, conks out. Okay, so here's the sort of the, the big version of the conjecture. It says that, well, sometimes my, my uh, coordinate subspaces in my degeneration, sometimes they're going to be fuzzy. Sometimes they're going to have multiplicities. But when they have multiplicities, this is exactly going to match up with these sort of duplicitous bumpless pipe dreams that have the same blank tiles. So in fact, you get this complete correspondence. You get, if you look at the bumpless pipe dreams for your permutation W, and you count them with their multiplicities, this will exactly match up with the various coordinate subspaces that you get from your diagonal Grobner degeneration, provided you count those also with the appropriate multiplicity, the scheme multiplicity. Okay, so this uh, is a conjecture in our paper, but it's kind of a, like a theorem in progress. Uh, by, uh, I, I guess, like Klein and uh, Wygant and maybe some other people. Okay. I'm not exactly sure. I think, I think the, uh, 
the reduced case of this, that first weaker conjecture, which I think that's now taken care of. I think we know exactly what's going on there, but it's a little more complicated to keep track of, of these multiplicities. The algebra gets more interesting. Okay, so uh, thank you. <laughs>